let's review the updated guidelines for diabetes in 2013. The majority of the information presented here is from the 2013 Standards of Medical Care in Diabetes guidelines from the American Diabetes Association. Please do keep in mind that medical information provided by this video must be considered as an educational service only. This video is not designed to substitute the advice of a qualified healthcare professional. Do not disregard or avoid professional medical advice or delay seeking it because of materials made available through this video. With the legal mumbo jumbo out of the way, let's get to it. So let's first talk about diagnosis. There are four basic ways of diagnosing diabetes. Hemoglobin A1c greater than 6.5%, a fasting plasma glucose greater than 126 milligrams, a two-hour plasma glucose greater than 200 milligrams after taking a 75 gram glucose load, or a random plasma glucose greater than 200 in a patient with symptoms of hyperglycemia or hyperglycemic crisis. Who should be tested for diabetes even though they may not have symptoms? Anyone who is overweight with a BMI greater than 25 and has one or more risk factors for diabetes. Risk factors include physical inactivity, first degree relative with diabetes, a high risk race or ethnicity. This includes African Americans, Latino, Native American, Asian American, and Pacific Islander. Women who delivered a baby weighing greater than 9 pounds or had previous gestational diabetes, hypertension, HDL cholesterol less than 35, triglycerides greater than 250, women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, hemoglobin A1c greater than 5.7 on previous testing, or history of cardiovascular disease. If someone doesn't have any of these risk factors or is not overweight, Testing for diabetes should begin at 45 years old. Repeat testing should be done at at least three year intervals. Children and adolescents should have two or more additional risk factors in addition to being overweight to be screened. Relatives of those with type 1 diabetes should be tested for antibody testing for risk assessment. What about pregnant women? Women should be screened for diabetes at the first prenatal visit using standard criteria at 24 to 28 weeks of gestation using a 75 gram 2 hour oral glucose tolerance test and at 6 to 12 weeks postpartum and lifelong screening for the development of diabetes in anyone with a history of gestational diabetes. What can be done to prevent diabetes in a patient with glucose intolerance? These patients should target a loss of 7% of body weight and increase in physical activity to 150 minutes per week of moderate activity. Metformin therapy for prevention of type 2 diabetes may be considered, especially in those with a BMI greater than 35, age less than 60, and women with prior gestational diabetes. Glucose monitoring can be tricky. When should patients monitor their sugars? Patients on multiple dose insulin or insulin pump therapy should check their glucose prior to meals, occasionally after meals, at bedtime, prior to exercise, and more frequently if they suspect low or high glucose. Hemoglobin A1c in patients who are stable can be checked twice a year. Hemoglobin A1c in patients who are not meeting their goals should be checked every three months. The hemoglobin A1c goal can be less than 6.5%, less than 7%, or even less than 8% depending on which type of patient you're talking about. The majority of folks can have a goal less than 7%. A goal of less than 6.5% is for select individuals who are not at risk for having hypoglycemia and do not have significant heart disease. A goal of less than 8% is for patients with significant comorbid conditions, long-standing diabetes, and advanced complications of diabetes. What is the overall approach to treatment? For type 1 diabetes, most people should be treated with multi-dose insulin injections and can have up to 3-4 to four injections per day of basal and prandial insulin. Some may be treated with a continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion. Education should include matching prandial insulin to carbohydrate intake, pre-meal blood glucose, and anticipated activity. 
screen these type 1 folks for other autoimmune diseases such as thyroid disease, vitamin B12 deficiency, and celiac disease as appropriate. For type 2 diabetes, the initial drug of choice is metformin. If a newly diagnosed type 2 diabetic has significantly elevated blood glucose levels or A1C, consider starting with insulin therapy from the beginning. If maximal monotherapy with oral agents does not achieve the hemoglobin A1C target over 3-6 to six months, and a second oral agent such as a GLP-1 receptor agonist or add insulin. What are some nutritional guidelines for diabetic patients? They should definitely see a registered dietitian or a diabetes educator. Saturated fat intake should be less than 7% of total calories. Weight loss is recommended for obese or overweight individuals. If during treatment a patient develops hypoglycemia, the preferred treatment for a conscious patient is glucose in any oral form. Patients at significant risk of severe hypoglycemia should be prescribed glucagon and caregivers should be instructed on how to administer it. In diabetics with a BMI greater than 35 with difficult to control comorbidities, they may be recommended for bariatric surgery. There is insufficient evidence to recommend surgery in patients with a BMI less than 35. Let's talk blood pressure. People with both diabetes and high blood pressure have a target blood pressure of 140 over 80. Lower targets may be appropriate for specific individuals. Lifestyle therapy for blood pressure includes reducing sodium and potassium, moderation of alcohol intake, and increased physical activity. Medication therapy should include an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker. GFR and potassium should be monitored with these drugs it is recommended to administer one or more blood pressure medications at bedtime. Blood pressure target goals for pregnant patients with diabetes and chronic hypertension include a systolic of 110 to 129 and a diastolic of 65 to 79. ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are contraindicated in pregnancy. What about cholesterol? In most patients with diabetes, a fasting lipid profile should be checked every year. Diet and exercise should be recommended for all patients. All diabetic patients should be given statin therapy who have cardiovascular disease or are over 40 with the history of hypertension, smoking, dyslipidemia, albuminuria, or a family history of cardiovascular disease. The LDL target in patients without overt cardiovascular disease in diabetics is less than 100 and in those patients with cardiovascular disease, the goal is less than 70. Keep in mind that statin therapy is contraindicated in pregnancy. Which diabetic patients should receive aspirin? Those with a 10-year risk of cardiovascular disease greater than 10% should receive aspirin. This would include most men greater than 50 and most women greater than 60 who have at least one major risk factor. Clopidogrel can be given as an alternative to patients who have an allergy to aspirin. It is reasonable to give combination aspirin and clopidogrel therapy up to a year after an acute coronary syndrome. Keep in mind that the thiazolidinodione therapy should be avoided in patients with symptomatic heart failure. Metformin should also be avoided in unstable or hospitalized patients with heart failure. Screening for nephropathy includes an annual creatinine and urine microalbumin starting in all new type 2 diabetic patients and type 1 diabetic patients who have had diabetes for 5 years. Nephropathy can be treated with ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. Retinopathy screening should start at the time of diagnosis for type 2 diabetics and within 5 years for type 1 diabetics. Subsequent exams should be at least annually. Laser photocoagulation therapy is indicated to reduce the risk of vision loss in patients with retinopathy. Diabetic macular degeneration and diabetic macular edema can be treated with anti-VEGF. Aspirin does not increase the risk of retinal hemorrhage. Annual screening of neuropathy and comprehensive foot examination should be done on all patients with diabetes. How should diabetic patients be managed if they are admitted to the hospital? In patients who are critically ill and found to be persistently hyperglycemic, it is recommended to have a target glucose range of 140 to 180 with insulin therapy. 
there is no clear evidence for non-critically ill patients. A general target pre-meal is less than 140, with the random glucose less than 180. The preferred insulin administration method for non-critically ill patients is scheduled basal, nutritional, and correctional subcutaneous insulin. Patients with hyperglycemia in the hospital without a prior diagnosis of diabetes should have follow-up testing after discharge. Let's spend two more minutes on oral diabetic medications. Sulfonylureas such as gliburide, glimipiride, and glipizide work by stimulating insulin release from the pancreas. They are cheap and work fast, but can cause weight gain and hypoglycemia. Metformin is a big one-eyed and works on the liver to decrease insulin resistance. It's also pretty cheap, helps with both LDL and triglycerides, does not cause weight gain, and has a low risk for hypoglycemia. Metformin does, however, cause a lot of GI side effects and is contraindicated in patients with moderate or severe kidney disease and heart failure. The medications pioglitazone and rosiglitazone reduce insulin resistance in fat and muscle. They improve HDL and decrease triglycerides and have a low risk of hypoglycemia. They do increase the risk of heart failure, cause weight gain, edema, anemia, and have a slow onset of action and can actually worsen LDL.